You're very welcome. Uh, Radio Spoil, episode 44. Uh, thank you to all the recent subscribers to the YouTube channel. Uh, we've a lot to get through uh, today. Let's just get straight on with it. You can see there, it's the Eva Brennan case we're covering. The case summary. Eva Brennan, aged 39 of Rockar, County Dublin, went missing on Sunday the 25th of July 1993 after leaving her parents' home in Ternure, South Dublin, and walking the 15 to 18 minute distance back to her apartment at Madison House on Rockar Road. She was formally reported missing to Ungarda Shikana on Tuesday, July 27th, by her father, Davy Brennan, when relatives had not heard from her since the recent Sunday afternoon. While it is believed Eva did return to her, depart- her apartment on the Sunday afternoon because the jacket she was wearing to her parents' house was fe- later found in her apartment, no witness sightings or CCTV footage recorded her on the journey home. Now, a delayed missing person inquiry was opened in the first week of her disappearance. Thorough and forensic searches of land and water for Eva in the locales of Rotgar and Ternure did not actually begin for many weeks later. Much of the initial search was conducted by Eva's family and friends. No trace of Eva Brennan was ever found or what her exact movements were. Exchanges with other people from about 2.30pm on Sunday, July 25, 1993. In later years, her family would be highly critical of the delayed official research. The initial investigation focused on Eva's state of mind and the potential that Angarda Shikana, rightly or wrongly, believed they were most likely dealing with a tragic case of suicide, or that Eva had disappeared by choice. It will be nearly three months before Gardy began to examine other possibilities. It's 2024. After more, almost 31 years, no trace of Eva Brennan has ever been found, nor an identified motive for her disappearance. We're going to take... Uh, to start with a brief um, news insert from uh, RTE news footage. This was the last year's 2023 appeal, uh, Garda appeal on the case. When we did, when we finish, when you finish seeing that, we're going to go straight into Kieran, Kieran McConnell, and we're going to go into the case background and then the timeline. Let's get on with it. Gardaí have renewed their appeal for information on the disappearance of a woman who went missing in Dublin 30 years ago. Eva Brennan has been described by one former cold case investigator as one of the forgotten missing persons. The 39-year-old was last seen in July 1993. At five foot seven, with blue eyes and brown hair cropped in a short bob, Eva Brennan was just weeks shy of her 40th birthday when she went missing on the 25th of July, 1993. She visited her parents' home in Rathdown Park that day. Her family are the last people known to have seen her. It's believed she returned home to her apartment in Rathgar as the jacket she wore that day was found there, but Eva has not been seen since. Her family raised the alarm that she was missing two days later, but expressed frustration at how her case was initially handled. When Eva went missing, we decided, because we had no help from the police, that we take matters into our own hands. We had posters made up, six of us were out looking for Eva's body, basically. We just tried everything, but at that time, we didn't know what to do. We just had to crawl our way along in the dark, and that's exactly what we did. There has been speculation that she was abducted and killed, or that she died by suicide. One thing is clear, her case received less publicity than those of some other women who disappeared in the 90s. In many respects, she's one of those who have been forgotten over the years. And for some reason or other, her disappearance never seemed to resonate with the public or the media as much as the disappearance of Annie McCarrick just a few short months before. Until such times we know what happened or where Eva is now, but those questions still remain unanswered. So moving on to our uh, case background, uh, Eva Brennan was born on the 4th of August uh, 1953, one of seven siblings born to Davy and Eileen Brennan. Davy owned two Dublin pubs, the Horse and Hound in Cabotili and the 108 in Ratgar. He was also involved in racehorse ownership 
and well known in the communities. Eva was the third eldest in the family of three sisters that included Eileen, Colette and obviously Eva herself and four brothers Paul, Robert, David and Peter. An affluent South Dublin family, Eva's brothers followed their father into the pub trade while their sisters mostly didn't work full time but their father ensured his daughters were all well provided for. Eva was a devout Catholic and her social outlets were her church, prayer group and small circle of friends. She also enjoyed dancing, buying clothes and being fashionable. Now, I don't normally do this, but I'm going to do this for this particular uh, case. And this isn't directed at subscribers. Uh, this is very much directed at my colleagues in the media. So side note for media. It's critical in every missing person case to know the description and characteristics of someone when appeals to the public are made. I've spoken about this before, it's little details that can make a difference in regards to someone being sure they have seen a missing person beyond just basic details of what they wore, their height, build, hair and eye colour. As an example of minor details that can be important, a person with a slight stammer, a limp, a curious gait of walking, a smoker, someone with a tick or a tremor. In the case of Eva Brennan, media were provided by Gardaí with family release photographs. Some of those images contained Eva smoking. Without permission, some of the images were taken and manipulated, essentially photoshopped, by media due to their own sensitivities to the world of political correctness we now live in. The following is one classic example of how manipulating an image can create its own issues and confusion. The image you're about to see and the two I have facing essentially the same image but one manipulated and one not. The image on the left is the family one provided. Not the greatest quality but it is what it is. The one on the right is the media manipulated one. Obviously the one on the right was created and photoshopped by some photo editor who thought he or she was creating an image for the front of Vogue magazine. In their desperate attempt to clean matters up, removing Eva's cigarette, they've introduced a right eye defect, given our hands and complexion of an Esquire model, buck teeth, and also altered her hair fringe. Yeah, if what's you, the story with the if, if, well, well, on. if you are a picture editor for a media company and are not happy with the quality that is provided to you by a family, you ask for a fucking another better quality image. You don't take it upon yourself to have free range to create an entirely inaccurate image because the original might upset and offend some sensitive soul. The kind of media indulgence and carry on, this really pissed me off and it's detrimental to the consequences on a missing person case uh, where witnesses might come forward with a piece of identification. Uh, Kieran, you wanted to say something? Yeah, thanks again for having me on, Mick. Um, the just like looking at the picture like who sent that out with the eyes like that like it's bon has... it's it's clearly what somebody has done in photoshop badly uh, i'll see if i can highlight the right eye here i'm looking you're, you're looking at the right uh, photo the right eye has clearly been photoshop copied and placed on the left eye as we look at it so right left for the person uh, and it's a botched job because we don't have symmetrical faces. One side of a face is always different on a person to the other. You can't just take one eye and bang it on the other and it's all perfect. The fringe, um, which is actually straight in the original picture, is now given all a flossy Vogue style, you know, magazine look. The complexion of the face, the removal of the cigarette, the book teeth were obviously put in because you know uh, the shadowing is too uh, too difficult the to see. And the also the jawline is oh so perfect in this picture. We are not perfect people, you know. And in a case, uh, Gardy Jenny will tell you they don't. They're not actually mad about you providing if you've got a loved one that's gone missing about providing let's say a wedding or a birthday photo 
or something like that of a missing person because it's not necessarily a reflection of when the person went missing and what they actually look like in all their wonderfulness and imperfections like from um, day to day it doesn't really give an accurate picture but like yeah if somebody smokes then it's probably better that that's in it's their better that, 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 that and 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 <laughs> no. even if you don't want to show the photograph fine that's okay you don't want to upset someone offend someone fine that's the world we live in but it's an important thing to mention in a description this person was a smoker you know or whatever or this person constantly when they walked was always seen wearing headphones because they were mad into music whatever weird quirky character mention them it's important because that might be the key that helps identify and corroborate somebody identified by a member of the public because a member of the public doesn't know Eva Brennan if they haven't seen her or known her before but something might trigger a series of links that say yeah somebody liked that and yeah that person was smoking and yeah that person also was wearing that similar dress yeah that person also had hair like that and then you go yeah this sounds more convincing this identification but when you start arsing around with pictures and presenting photo models and Vogue magazine covers of a missing person, you don't help the case. You're doing a disservice to the family and to everyone. Let's move on. We've enough said about that. And I'm not going to bring this up again in other cases. But please, if you're interested in missing person cases, always watch out for that when you see photographs of a missing person. Does the photograph look too touched up does it look too perfect because it is some little editor has been busily uh, walking away and the image is probably not what the original image should be oh, it's very okay. strange yeah. behavior altogether doing that it's 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 wrong it's just wrong full stop eva moved into her new ratgar apartment in 1990 leaving the family home in tenure at the age of 36 Eva decided that she wanted her own place and her parents were instrumental in ensuring her safety in a first floor, one bedroom apartment at Madison House, which literally overlooked the street, Rockar Road, where one of her father's two pubs was located. That was the 108. Um, this is uh, an extract from Sarah McInerney's book, uh, Where No One Can Hear uh, You uh, Scream. It's, it's page, page 159. It is a good book, but yeah. I did find some issues with this particular case that was covered in a chapter and she's just referencing uh, the choice of apartment uh, and she's saying you know it was quiet settled and safe area of Dublin in fact Eva's apartment which sat over an archway on the first floor had been carefully chosen by her parents specifically because it would be difficult to access for a burglar and other unwanted um, visitors uh, when Eva decided to move out, Mum and Dad helped her to find the place, and they put a lot of thought into this. Says Colette, Colette McCann, the sister. They found her apartment in this gorgeous spot uh, opposite the uh, the church. Now, um, this is Madison House, Radgar. This is the apartment complex that Eva Brennan uh, lived in. In previous years, Eva had had treatment at St. Patrick's Hospital for depression and had been prescribed antidepressive medication at the time. She had initially began suffering from depression from the age of 16 and medication could sometimes play havoc with her weight. However, it is important to note she was not under any medical care or the actual, at the actual time of her disappearance in July. 1993 um kieran just before yeah. i move on from this image that people can see um of madison house any is is there anything that strikes you because we will yeah. touch on this touch on this very shortly when I we wanted, get into yeah the i wanted to just ask your opinion on something there Mick. what would you think that place is difficult to break into or what would be your feeling like how would you define somewhere as difficult to break into i i suppose anywhere is more of a challenge when it's beyond the uh, ground floor yeah um and uh, this classic of the area uh, where the ground floor is literally ground floor i mean in fact it's almost half basement half ground floor and then you've got the first floor 
and this is a very classic example of that if you notice the uh, the, bo- the, the well. bottom the bottom windows jesus the bottom windows are almost knee high to you um you know if you stood there your head would almost be above the top of the uh the ground floor window um i will talk about this shortly um there was mentioned that her apartment was directly over what's described as an archway i did look at this building very carefully on google maps it's still much the same hasn't changed in 31 years uh, i couldn't quite find an archway as such but i would it be think the gate there would that be what it means i think it's, it's that tree there to the right i think actually blocks where oh, the oh, the okay. archway i think we'll see actually i do have a video insert um in in the uh the episode on from rte and it does actually show more uh this this uh, madison house uh, so i think i know where the specific apartment was but it doesn't make it any easier to get into as such but however let's let's move on for the moment uh in the previous years eva had treatment at st patrick's hospital for depression and it being prescribed antidepressive medication at the time. Okay, I've read it. Um, Eva was very close to her family, though sometimes difficult and strong-minded. She depended on them for financial and emotional support. Not all of her siblings shared her deeply religious convictions, and it would be reasonable to say that Eva lived a somewhat quiet and protected upbringing. And again, quoting Sarah McInerney in her interview with um, Eva's sister, um, Colette McCann although our family uh, can uh, be certain they think that Eva went to mass that morning because she normally went to mass every day she was a very religious woman and to quote Colette she always had this thing of going to mass says Colette Sp- it's been, we won't go into I hate when writers do this she went to mass every day she always laughs at my sister Eileen and myself and says that God had put her on earth to pray for us heathens That's it's just a quip from Colette but it emphasises that she was very religious and it was known within the family and the rest of the family didn't quite always share that point of view or belief she was someone who never wanted to be too far from her cl- close family circle of friends Kieran. You know, she's like, even like, I know back then people, Ireland was a lot more of a religious place, but mm. she's like very religious because she'd go to um, mass like every day. And then I think most nights she'd go to prayer groups. Like that's like pretty much most of her. I, life, like, I, I would say, church. Kieran, even, even in 1993, mm. and I would have been what, in my twenties then, um, even, yeah. You know, even then, I would think this is particularly devout for, yeah. You know, for for a person. But then, then I have to remember, I would have been in my twenties. Um, Eva would have been, you know, approaching uh, her fortieth um, birthday. In fact, her fortieth birthday, if I'm not mistaken, and I don't mention this because I think it is, maybe or maybe not relevant. Her actual birthday was about a week later on the bank holiday weekend, and we'll get into bank holidays and stuff like that very shortly yeah, that, if that be misreported the bank holiday or something I, I think it? so yeah I'm, we're yeah. going to touch on that Let, let's not, we won't jump too far ahead we'll get into no. our timeline in our new apartment she was house proud and our daily activities mainly consisted of church service and evening prayer meetings at her Legion of Mary group as much a devotion it was also her main social outlet now most days Eva would call into her parents and have lunch or dinner there. She was not one really for cooking much at home in her apartment. As normal on Sunday, July 25th, 1993, she is believed to attend the church service at St. Joseph's Church in nearby Tenure around 1pm. She called to her parents' home on Rathdown Park for a typical Irish Sunday roast dinner and a get-together with her parents and some of her siblings. That's um, St. Joseph's uh, Church. you know, it's a classic um, Catholic Irish church in Ternur, uh, close to her parents' home. She could be difficult at times. She took issue with the choice of uh, the lamb roast in the oven that the family were having. 
and following a quip aimed at her direction by our uh, brother Paul that if she didn't like dinner she'd go somewhere else she upped and left the house this wasn't anything unusual and our parents and siblings were well used to these flighty gestures and thought nothing of this minor incident however it would be the last time they ever laid eyes on Eva as she walked down the garden driveway on that Sunday lunchtime they all thought ah sure she'll be back tomorrow like she always is except Eva didn't turn up the following day Monday as normal for lunch at her parents house in fact no one in the family had heard from Eva all through late Sunday and into Monday on the Tuesday now deeply concerned her father Davy, with the assistance of a barman from his pub broke a window and gained entry into Eva's apartment at Madison house it was spotless and there was no sign of Eva there she was reported missing that day and has never been seen since for more than 30 years uh, Kieran we're going to move into the timeline and, and more you want to say when we really now we're into you, you thought you heard a lot there <laughs> we're now into <laughs> deep dive boys and girls I just got to ask um, yeah just um, did she go straight from mass to her parents house Do you we, know? we don't know we don't have don't we don't have as we'll go through in the tunnel we don't have accurate times for did you go to an early mass go back home do something else get something to eat then go back go to her parents home yeah did she go so and do a late a late there. yeah that right up to yeah. noon i did check those to church i can't find the church times from 1993 but pretty much <laughs> pretty much you know most churches even back then go right up to a lunchtime mass so my thinking is did she go to maybe 12 o'clock mass leave her apartment go to 12 o'clock mass and then go on directly to her parents home in Ternure. that yeah. that's my thinking but i i can't say for certain because we don't have exact times okay so into our timeline analysis so we're going to pick up uh, the timeline on the day of eva's disappearance because eva was a private person while her routine was known we cannot always give specific times due to lack of CCTV footage and limited witness information. So, to the day of disappearance. Sunday, July 25th, 1993. It's a pleasant sunny day. Eva Brennan lived on her own in a one-bedroom plush apartment at Madison House in Ratgar. When she awoke, what are exact movements in or out of the house cannot be exactly established until that lunchtime. We have our routine in general. Church service that morning was a fundamental part of it. While our apartment complex overlooked the church, Eva preferred the family church of St. Joseph in Ternio for service. It is situated about halfway between our apartment and our parents' home. We do not know the time of the morning service she attended, whether it was 8 a.m., some services even start at 7 a.m., whether it was noon, but sometime between then, it's believed she attended a service. We do know that Eva was wearing a raincoat, pink tracksuit and leggings, a man's wrist watch with a brown strap, and she carried a red leatherette handbag around 8 inches by 10 inches with a flap to the front. She was very slim built, 5 foot 7 inches, short brown hair and blue eyes. At 38 year, 39 years of age, Eva actually looked considerably younger, more, more like she was in her late 20s or early 30s. Now, uh, you're looking at a, a map location. I'll do an insert of this image into uh, as, a, as a still picture into the video. I also do have um, a video coming up where I actually were going to get on the ground with boots uh, in the car and actually drive this road. Uh, so you can see there, uh, top right corner is where Madison House is. That's up here. Uh, it's a relatively straight journey. You can see St. Joseph's there. So again, it's roughly halfway. Turn off here, um, left. You're down towards and into um, Rotdown Park uh, in Tenure. Uh, Rafarnham, um, the Bushy Park area is over here down the bottom, Kieran. 
Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Um, okay, uh, please don't <laughs> stop. Don't keep saying sorry for interrupting. You're allowed to interrupt. Your, uh, trail of thought. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you'd be more familiar with the area than me, but like this would be quite a busy road and area, right? She's going through a lot of kind of centers and stuff, right? It seems. I'll tell you how familiar I am with the area. In a past and distant life, Mick Rooney was uh, worked for Raffarnham Dairy. At that age, 17, 18, my first job was helping on a wholesale truck delivering milk. <laughs> this area was my patch. I know this like the back of my hand. I know every road here. I know St. Luke's Hospital where we delivered. I know Ternur. I know, I'm sure some of the shops have changed. I know where we delivered milk to the shops. Uh, we didn't do door-to-door -door sales. It was wholesale sales. Schools, shops, supermarkets, that kind of thing. I know this area like the back of my hand. I was in this area back in the... Would have been mid-80s, around 85, 86. Wouldn't have dramatically changed up to 93. No, I would have been there at 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m., 9 a.m., right through until lunchtime, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I know this area, and I know what it's like. This area is busy. Whether it's 7 a.m. or whether it's 7 p.m., this area is a bustling and busy area, and would have been even more so in 1993. Yeah. There's always somebody walking by. There's always people on yeah. the ground. Yeah. It is flatland territory. Residential areas mixed with lots of bustling village town shops. Flatland area. This is a busy area. Doesn't matter what time of the day. There's always somebody about. The streets are never, ever, ever deserted. Okay. Uh, 1 p.m. Eva arrived at our parents' home in Rotdown Park, Ternure. We cannot be absolutely certain if Eva attended the church service that morning at St. Joseph's and returned home, or she attended a late noon service and then immediately made her way to her parents' house. But sometime around, we are told from the relatives, the family, she arrived. So sometime we're in a window of 1 p.m. to 2 p.m., there are varying accounts of how long Eva was at her parents' house. Other siblings came and went for the, uh, for the family dinner gathering before and after. In short, at some point between the sitting room and kitchen were family members scattered around. Eva is reported to have examined the roast cooking in the oven and took exception to the choice of lamb once again. A quip from her brother Paul that if she didn't like the lamb dinner she could go and have dinner somewhere else. The family considered her something of the princess of the family with her airs and graces and that they were well used to her sudden gestures of dissatisfaction. After this, none of the family saw or heard from Eva that day or the next day when she left the house in a huff. Um, we're going to take an insert now and I'm going to actually do that boots on the ground uh, drive from uh, Madison House to Ratgar uh, Park Map trip. Okay, map time. Uh top right sort of corner is Madison House bottom left is Ratdown Park so from where Eva lived down to where uh, her parents lived in Ratdown Park this is the uh, R114 road this is the uh, Ratgar um, road uh, this complex in here is uh, Madison House where uh, Eva lived. Uh, you can see beautiful building, um, red brick building. Um, we're now going to move down uh, along Ratgar Road. We don't have far to go along this road. Uh, you can see it's it's not a residential area. It's quite a busy sort of village come town area. Uh, the one o. Eight pub is just past this truck on the right corner. Uh, now I want to emphasise it's slightly changed there. Um, 
this is obviously a more recent uh, Google Maps. We're through the junction now. Uh, that's what the uh, 108 pub looked like much, much closer to the 1990s and the sort of early, mid-1990s. Uh, thank you, Peter Cain, uh, for that um, image. We're on now down past that junction uh, onto the Ternior Road. Uh, and really, it's it's just a, a straight run down uh, and right down Park is off to the left when you get further down here. And you can see we're now beyond the um, uh, sort of Rockgar village and we're into a much more residential, leafy, classic suburban area. Um, very well sought after uh, place uh, to live. Um, a lot of these buildings now, they wouldn't have been originally in the sort of 50 to 100 years ago, but now a lot of them are very much, I suppose what we might call, some of them residential, uh, some of them very classic uh, sort of flatland apartment areas. And uh, now, so a lot of the houses in this area would have been turned into, um, and you can see some newer flat complexes uh, built there. Um, yeah, so a lot of the this area, some of the buildings, the residential buildings would have been turned into uh, separate flats. Uh, this is uh, the church we have spoken about in the timeline. This is St. Joseph's Church. Now, this is uh, within the uh, Ternure uh, catchment area. And this is where daily um, Eva Brennan uh, would have attended a church service. Again, your, your typical classic... Um, Catholic uh, Church. We're on now, and uh, soon we're going to be coming up to the uh, junction uh, where you uh, turn off, uh, uh, turn your uh, park for Rat Down. You go through this particular uh, junction here, and it's our turn off is coming up shortly, and it's uh, it's just uh, coming up here now to the left. Again, we're into the, that's uh, through uh, Ternior, and we're onto the uh, Temple Oak Road. It basically, if you continue down here, it would take you in towards the area of I think it's uh, uh, Temple Oak, and you know into the area of uh, Bushy Park, Raffarnham. Then uh, further on, uh, we're passing Fergus Road here. That's to the left. Um, Rat Down Park is just a little bit further on. And you can see a bus parking there. Uh, sorry, yeah, passing there. Now, I want to emphasize, I think it was the number 10 bus did pass partly through in the 1993 uh, area where um, Eva lived, but there was no real actual direct route from A to B, as it were. That is, from uh, Madison House to directly um, uh, past the church and directly to, here we are, uh, Rat Down Park where um, Eva Brennan grew up uh, with her, uh, her, her other six, six uh, siblings. Um, and that's really it. I mean, it's, it's not a complex journey. There's no crazy turning off here, going up there, turning there, going off. There. You know, it's, it's relatively boom through one village, boom through the other village, and you're there. Uh, the journey is about, about... And, and I'm really careful here because it depends on how fit you are, uh, what kind of walk you are. You quick walker, slow walker. I know they talk about the so-called um, ten to twelve minute journey for one kilometer. I, 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 that's very, very mathematically based. That's not necessarily that accurate. I will put this journey reasonably at about from Madison House to Rat. Um, to uh, Rat Down uh, Park around about the 15 maybe maximum 18 minute journey and, and that's a, a relatively, not a very quick pace, relatively um, easy pace and really now uh, nothing more to show we're, we're, if you're, we're going back in the opposite direction, we're going back now um, uh, through um, turning up my heading back towards uh, Rat Gar again Boom, one village, boom, the other village. And that that really is, that is it. But please do, where you pick out businesses or landmarks here, 
again the uh, St. Joseph's Church again I want to emphasize this is a modern uh, Google map street map um, uh, view uh, but nothing dramatically is the roads haven't dramatically changed it's just the businesses you might have noticed would have been refurbished and changed and that kind of thing um, look that's that's really it um, we've taken you on the journey that we believe uh, Eva made uh, on the lunchtime of um, July 25th 1993 so Monday uh, July 26th 1993 the Brennan family are preparing lunch and pretty much expect Eva to come waltzing in as normal as part of our routine without even a mention of the previous day's departure they know Eva very well she has her moments and they quickly come and pass and all is forgotten except there's no Eva that day at the family home by the evening Davy Brennan or Eva's father is becoming concerned he checks in with Eva's brother other brothers and sisters who live in various close by areas of Chernyur, Ratgar and Rafarnham her other siblings live farther away in Dartry and Klonski. They also have not heard from Eva. He is particularly concerned when her brother Paul, who doesn't live that far away from the family home and Eva often calls into, hasn't seen or heard from her either. Tuesday the 27th, her father, David Brennan, goes to her apartment, Madison um, House, he rings Eva's doorbell and gets no answer on the intercom. He returns a little while later with a barman from his pub and they break a window and force entry. Now I want to note again this is another um, media inaccuracy. I, I came across multiple uh, as I do when I go through the media archives multiple confusions here about that he got a barman from the horse and hound and the one away. I'm reasonably confident it was from the 108 in Ratgar, the closest pub. His other pub was over in Cabantiri and the Horse and Hound. And if you're in a state of concern about your daughter, you ain't fucking jumping in the car and going across to Cabantiri to get a barman from there. Yet, mul I saw multiple early outlets um, refer to the uh, barman from the Horse and Hound. I don't believe that's that's... Um, entirely accurate well I, I'm pretty sure it isn't accurate they find the apartment spotless when they get inside I think it was the barman who crawled in the window remember you might be asked just put yourself in mind her father was 73 okay so just keep that in mind the barman gets in the window and they immediately notice the place is spotless and a chair where Eva's raincoat is draped it's the same raincoat that she wore on the Sunday there is no sign of the clothes or pink track suit top she was wearing they search and find that her handbag purse keys cash and rich wrist watch the male wrist watch she wore are nowhere to be seen about a month later the family will also locate her passport and other documents in the apartment that Eva would have needed should she have travelled somewhere there is no sign of a disturbance or anything untoward Davy reports his daughter missing to Ungarda Shiakana. Now we're into July August 1993. While a missing persons file is raised and details taken from the family, there are no alerts issued immediately. Gardy advised the family that as Eva is an adult, we've heard this so commonly in cases during the 80s and 90s in Ireland, and given there is no evidence of a crime, she is likely to turn up soon and make contact with them. In the following weeks, with regular visits by the family members to the Gardaí, they finally ascertain more information on Eva's background. Their limited investigation begins to shift to Eva's <coughs> previous bouts of depression and treatment at St. Patrick's Hospital. It takes weeks before Gardaí really investigate a thorough land and water search for Eva. The Gardaí's suspicions are that Eva may have committed suicide. Much of the initial local searching is conducted by Eva's family and friends. They are certain that she has neither taken her own life nor ran off and disappeared. Both scenarios, without the simplest note left behind, would also seem to counter her religious convictions and reliance on her family. 
Eva was a staunch Catholic, there was no suicide note and Eva's remains were never found. As the Gardaí seemed to have little interest in pursuing the matter, her father Davy, a well-known businessman, a member of the Fianna Fáil political party, he used his connections to enlist the help of the then Irish state, Irish head of state, Albert Reynolds, in compelling the authorities to act fully on his daughter's disappearance. Thanks to Davy Brennan's persistence, the Texas began to conduct a more thorough investigation. Unfortunately, Eva had already been missing for over a month. A forensic Nick, examination, Kieran. Yeah, not to defend the guards there, but I suppose one thing I was just thinking there, like back in 93, it would have been quite, um, I don't know if unusual is the right word, but for somebody to spend time in a psychiatric facility for depression, like much people wouldn't have openly talked about mental health as much back then. Obviously, well, well I, I just, I, I want to clarify on that. I, I, I do not know if Eva spent time in the facility or was supported an outpatient, uh, yeah. as an outpatient. So uh, let's be very clear on that. I, 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 don't, right. I don't know specifically, um, but but that that the, the family had been very open on that 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 was, and they were it, dep- those depressive issues were issues that Eva had since she was around the age of sixteen. Yeah, so she was never really suicidal or anything. No. No, 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 not certainly not that we know of. So Eva uh, had been missing for over a month. A forensic examination of Eva's apartment was eventually conducted, but her family had already cleaned up because the apartment had begun gathering dust and was becoming unkempt. Thus, the examination uncovered no evidence. Rather late investigation also shed no light on what may have happened to Eva. Uh, and we're going back to Sarah McInerney's book uh, where no one uh, can hear you scream, page 166. Uh, she does mention that the Browns had hired a private investigator in the following months and the case, uh, and they paid him for, the, for a period of four months. At the end of every week, they waked hoping for news despite his efforts he never came up with any new information yeah god we we heard this before i think even the annie mccarrick case didn't they have one two three private investigators it's not the only case we've heard uh, families having to do this after a considerable sum of money led only to weeks of disappointment and silence on their sister's whereabouts they terminated the contract another avenue exhausted 12 months passed and a flurry of searching uh, interviews and grief Finally, one year after Eva's disappearance, her siblings unlocked her apartment and went inside to clean. Uh, sorry, that's after a month, I should say. Went inside. Uh, we dusted and hoovered and washed everything in sight. And it was after that that the police went in and took footprints, said Colette, Colette McCann, uh, the sister. The family believed that harm had come to Eva at the hands of of someone else Kieran I just want to touch on a point here mm. uh, you, you, you tell me whether I'm right or wrong mm. in the first month I, I'm trying to get my head around this mm. in the first month the family were convinced something happened their beloved daughter sibling sister Eva that she had been taken, abducted. Mm. Harm had come to her. They wanted help from the police. I get it. I understand they they weren't getting enough help. I mm. understand that they went to examine the apartment. What the hell were they thinking when they did what they did? I I cannot get my head around that they went in, wanted more help from the police, more forensic examination, but they went in there and they cleaned the place. Yeah, it's um What was what what thinking was going on there with the family? I, I have no it, idea. You know, see I I understand the guards would be frustrated on that one. I suppose like to play devil's advocate or 
offer a counter argument, I suppose you could say like maybe in ninety three they like weren't so forensically aware, but then she had been missing, so they probably would have been aware of stuff like that, right? Uh, but then they were kind. She was very house proud, right? So maybe her sister thought, oh, she wouldn't like the apartment like this. It could have been an emotional it, may, reaction. an emotional no. reaction. Maybe, like God forbid, she'll come back and. Yeah. Oh God, you know, Eva, she'll start having a go at us then. Why didn't you clean me apart? Well, look at the state of it. Look at the dust. Of it. Oh, yeah. Maybe that was her thinking. And they might so have, forgive me if anybody thinks I'm jumping to the gun. You, might, I just, you never know. They might have um, given up a bit and been like, oh, the guards are never going to come. Or yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the point of kind of frustration, I suppose. It, it yeah. might just be one of those things that just, it's a bad break, you know. But for anybody who ever, God forbid, finds himself in this position and they feel they're not getting help, please do not repeat that exercise. Yeah, I think it's, nowadays, though, yeah, everybody yeah. would be kind yeah. of aware of that straight away. Yeah. But one thing I, I did want to know about the apartment, if you ever, did she have a landline, you know, a telephone in the apartment? Yes. She did, yeah. Yeah. Um. So September 1993, Gary exhausts their land and water searches. Everything seems all too lacklustre and too late for any value. Now we're going to quickly start to move on through this timeline because really there isn't a great deal happening in this case. We're going from 93 quickly through to 2024. Yeah, this year. Here we go. In the intervening years, the family heightened their appeals for information. They even paid a private detective, we mentioned that reference it in Sarah McInerney's book, for many months to try and unearth something, but all came to no avail. Now I will mention, uh, not great news for people but please understand at the time of Eva's disappearance in 1993 Eva's dad was already uh, 73 uh, both his uh, parents were effectively elderly and um, there was a wide age gap between the seven seven siblings some in their 40s some in their I think their very late teenage years going into their 20s so in 1998, during this year, Eva's sister Colette McCann takes part in an RTE TV documentary on the case uh, called True Lives um, Missing. I did try to, I did contact somebody in RTE and tried to get hold uh, of a copy of this documentary for extracts. They're normally very good with me. Um, I, we couldn't get a hold of it in the time for uh, this recording. Um, I think we said this before about this like a real public service would be to have all these crime all things of these things crime crime call programs time. all it should be there it's it's a national state TV it should yeah. be there this nonsense a, of sorry we taped like, over that or it's not available or we can't find it it's not good enough like, yeah this is a public service that's being paid for it's not good enough no, not at all. Garden National Appeals quickly move from once a year to once every five to ten years. Now, sadly, Eva's father, Davy, died on February the 28th, 2001, eight years after his uh, daughter's um, disappearance. He was 81. He died from uh, stomach cancer. Uh, Eva's sister, Colette McCann, who was featured in that documentary I just mentioned, um, uh, uh, um, she passed away in 2015. She'd been one of the primary family campaigners. Eileen Brennan, Eva's mother, has also passed away. She passed away on the 14th of January, 2019. Um, yeah, you can, Kieran, you can kind of understand why this case sadly has lost all impetus and attention yeah, and wh where key family members are sadly no longer with us. Yeah, it seems the most, to be honest, the most recent thing that's came up about it in the whole time was like RTE kind of did an extended um, news report on it. And um, Alan Bailey, I, he was a detective that worked on Operation Trace. He gave a bit of an interview to RTE. And that was, to be honest, probably the most. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 uh, uh, our viewers, uh, please understand when we record this, we record it live sections and then we post produce 
our subscribers and viewers will have already actually seen that very uh, news piece that you see in that that yeah that, I've uh, seen it myself four or five a few times, uh, so. minute news piece yeah. with with detective uh, uh, ex detective uh, Adam Bailey uh, on it so please understand they are they they will be familiar with it they have, they have just seen it yeah so it's actually it's good work by RTE like you know as we're yeah, it's something we're and considering it was 2023 or, they could have said ah there's there's other more important yeah. cases you know why, why go back to this one but in fairness. On that anniversary, the thir- the thirtieth anniversary last year, yeah. they did. I doubt we'll see too much. Uh, maybe well, would you this, say, this would you July. Agree that's the most significant kind of movement, like in the public eye, anyway. Probably in the public eye, yes, yes, right? yes. in the public yeah. eye, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a long time. Too long. Okay, we're now moving to our, I suppose, closing and critical part where we try and as best we can and what we have try to closely examine and and see if we can just make sense of this and fit something together what makes sense what doesn't despite being reported missing just three months after Annie McCarrick vanished Eva Brennan's disappearance did not seem to garner as much attention from the Gardaí media and general public my concern at this point is that we've had a police force dealing at the time 1993 one of the most high profile missing person cases for several months with huge national and intermediate international media attention and that, that of course is the Annie McCarrick case had required significant resources time guard a focus um, and I'm sure they were exhausted all the media attention was on that case so it's not known what time Eva returned to her home that Sunday and left again, even if she did. But what is most remarkable is actually that there were no reported sightings of Eva since she was seen leaving her parents' home uh, in Ternure. To get from her parents' home to her apartment, she would have to walk along the populated Temple Oak Road through the centre of Ternure, which contains several restaurants, pubs, businesses, before reaching her home at Madison House, Ratgar, on a pleasant <coughs> sunny uh, July afternoon. You, you've already seen the, the walk through, the drive through piece. Really, come on, people. You know, somebody it isn't, is see, somebody isn't seeing, somebody isn't seeing, you know, it's crazy, hate. it's no nuts. There. Yeah. yeah, I always thought that very odd. So Eva would have also had to pass through Ratgar town a busy crossroads which also contains several pubs, restaurants and businesses despite presumably travelling through such busy places no sightings of Eva were ever reported Eva's family are prominent members of their community her father was a successful businessman who owned two pubs in the Dublin area one literally in Rotgar where she disappeared and was involved in politics and known in the horse racing community Eva had six other siblings and had grown up in the vicinity, making it all the more bizarre that nobody saw Eva that Sunday beyond just her family. Uh, Mick, I'd use you as a better source than Google Maps on this. So, um, when she, the way she walked home, is there like an alternative or a back way she that, could have walked? Uh, 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 when we do these maps, we think of the most logical straight route yeah. that it would be. Of course, you can never exclude we've seen from the map yeah of course there's turn that way there's a shortcut here they cross that, that way get back onto that road of course but why would you go that way yeah? what, what why why yeah. why go why go that way it, it doesn't make any it wouldn't make any sense you're putting more it, time it would on make it. her journey vastly longer if she was uh, vastly her. vastly yeah. longer vastly longer I, th- I think i said the distance there on maybe a casual walk will be around 15 minutes really slow walk might be 20 to 24 minutes but really you know you'd really want to be walking slow uh, to take that long um so i'd put it i know people say oh you can walk a kilometer in 10 to 12 minutes but look you know um it's it, it depends on you your fitness your attitude where you are what you're doing what you're looking at are you pausing are you crossing over back and forward the streets traffic lights how busy is it is is the footpath busy with people you know there's all sorts of things that can change that time you know yeah. so we have to consider all those things it, yeah. yeah 
So Eva would have also had to pass. Yeah. Um, Eva, uh, with, with Eva being so heavily involved in church activities, a local Legion of Mary prayer group, social friends whom she knew from these activities, no one beyond her family, from the minute Eva rose on the Sunday morning to the late afternoon or evening, when she seems to have disappeared after leaving her parents' house in Chenier, reports sighting her or meeting her. Now, in essence, um, we are to accept that the only people who bore witness to Eva Brennan that day were her own family members. That's simply not possible. I can uh, perhaps accept that the lack of there's a lack of TV at the given time. Remember, 1993. Uh, combined with the whole lacklustre and delayed search for Eva by the Gardaí. But there are a lot of things in this case which don't make sense or add up at all, and these begin at the start of our time which we went through. Eva lived on the first floor of her apartment block at Madison House on Rakar Road, something her parents felt strongly about in regards to Eva's privacy and safety. I guess this was understandable to avoid greater risk of burglary to, of a ground floor apartment. And yet, on Tuesday the 27th, her father with the assistance of a barman, seem to be able to break a window and force entry to Eva's apartment. There's little or no detail as to how this event came about and was specifically achieved. What specific apartment window and was there a ladder used? Davy Brennan, Eva's father, was 73 years of age in 1993 and it is entirely understandable that he needed assistance, but why have you never heard from the barman who, who assisted that day? Respected journalist and news reporter Sarah McInerney in her book, Where No One Can Hear You Scream, details an extensive interview with the sister of Eva and case campaigner Colette McCann, you've mentioned her. McInerney conducted the interview with Colette <coughs> for inclusion in her book with a full chapter dedicated to the case of Eva Brennan's disappearance. For reasons of what follows, I think it's important to note this initial chapter error. Uh, to quote, from the book at right at the start of the chapter Eva Brennan was 39 years old when she went missing it was Sunday 25th of July 1993 the afternoon of a bank holiday weekend a summer's day a mild calm day a day for doing very little that is incorrect it was not a bank holiday I have no idea the where bank holidays are at the start of the month right the start of the month and it's also it was a bank holiday no, not, yeah, I think there's a bank holiday at the start of the month, and it's then a bank holiday in August. That was actually funny enough. The bank holiday would have... The, the August sec, second bank holiday was the following week, and I think that's where um, Sarah has confused it with. That's the August bank holiday, the, the first Sunday, Monday in August. Uh, I don't know why Sarah w went with this and didn't check it out. Um, and it was also this quote from uh, Colette McCann that both confused and concerned me. Uh, again, to quote the interview with Sarah McInerney, after a short pause, Colette shakes her head and starts speaking again, her voice stronger now as she tells of the phone call from her father that changed her life. This is the critical line. I had been away for the weekend anyway, she says. Dad rang here and said Eva's missing. I just said, how do you mean she's missing? He said, she's not around. She's not in our apartment. We haven't seen her since Sunday. Now, I, I, I want to, yeah, I, I, I want to tread no, carefully no. here. I, I have no intention of upsetting the family of Eva Brennan. But critically, if sister and main family campaigner Colette McCann had been away for the weekend, then our first hand account of the Sunday family get together is actually second hand information recounted by what she was told by her family, but not actually heard or witnessed by her. And yet some of her quotes seem to come across and not just in fairness to Sarah's book and the interview, but also in general in interviews that Colette gave. Um, yeah, gave come across she as, gave if, as if as if she was there. The above, if anything, seems to underline that Colette was not actually present that Sunday at lunchtime. Her father Davy saying, we, we, the family lot, us, not you, we, haven't seen her since Sunday. 
I am left asking, was Colette away prior to Sunday? And perhaps was that maybe she was able to return to the family home for the Sunday lunch? Or was she away for the weekend after Sunday lunch? But that would include Monday the 26th, but that's not part of the weekend. If journalist Sarah McEnany honestly believed that the events of July 25th, 26th, Sunday to Monday was a bank holiday, incorrectly, it ex- maybe explains why she didn't pick up or question this. For me, this changes the complexion of the case. Of the two parents, six other siblings and their younger children, if they were brought to the house, because remember they're such varying ages, of Eva, I want to know who was actually present in the parents' house at Rotdown Park at lunchtime on Sunday, July the 25th. Because after all this, I'm not closer to knowing that. I know Paul was there, said he was there. Colette seems to have said she was there in some interviews, but actually she tells Sarah McEnany she was away for the weekend. But hang on a second, what's... Let's, let's get our story straight here. Who was there and who wasn't? You know, if, if I'm Gardy examining this case, I want a list of everybody who was there. I don't care whether you were six months of age or 60 years of age. I want a list of everybody who was in that house, what time you arrived, what time you left, what you witnessed, what you heard. End of. No arguments. I don't want, I was away for the weekend, I might have, he said this, she said that. That's not good enough in a missing person case. And unfortunately, the lack of Garda attention, I think, is at the root of what is being missed and all that. We don't know. We're now, unfortunately, not to the fault of the family having to rely on things that change over years and years and how stories yeah, are no, recounted. There's, no, um, there's not necessarily a chain of evidence, but there's no yeah. like, documented police. There's, there's no documented or, like, evidence that we can refer to. This is a problem. Know. Yeah, this is a huge problem. Because without any later established CCTV or witness witnesses after 1pm, the parents' house actually remains Eva Brennan's last known place of existence. I know that many of you will ask about Eva's previous relationships. Eva wasn't much of a romantic, but she had two previous boyfriends. The relationships didn't last, and with Eva, you had to accept a strong-minded lady with her own faith and convictions. Uh, again, to quote Sarah McInerney's uh, interview, they also found an ex-boyfriend of Eva's who had moved to Liverpool, and he had nothing to tell them. Uh, to quote uh, Colette, she didn't have a boyfriend at the time, says Colette. She had a couple of boyfriends in the past, and at one stage, one of the men gave her a ring, but I don't think it was an engagement ring. I think it was more of a friendship ring. She was going out with one man for a while, but for the most part, she wasn't really interested in romance. She was very busy going to our prayer meetings or going dancing or meeting with friends yeah, she was very busy okay <laughs> I, I'm trying not to be judgmental here but this is why some of these cases confuse me and, and you know it's just uh, you know make it's always though perceived by the person that's telling the story I don't mean that in a condescending yeah, way yeah. But, you know Certain people judge busy by different mm. standards. <laughs> true, true. Evidentially, the only item that appears back at Eva's apartment in the day or two later is her raincoat jacket. As a chain of corroborative evidence, witnessed by her family alone and recovered from her apartment and nothing else she was wearing and carrying, bag, purse, keys, watch, no witnesses after she leaves the house, I can't get Eva from Ratdown Park to Madison House on the return journey or thereafter on the later afternoon of the evening of July the 25th. With such a busting house of relatives, we can't even be certain exactly what time she arrived, what amount of time she remained there and what time she left, supposedly no later than 2.30pm. I'm left with these scenarios, but I have to be honest based on what's known and Eva's last known place of witness. This is always difficult and upsetting, but I have to remove myself from just assuming or simply accepting what cannot be proven or known. Kieran and I have to be forensic in our assessments. The possibilities are, Eva never left her parents' home. Eva completely unnoticed by anyone 
returns to Madison House and then departs once again unseen and leaves her jacket there. Perhaps she met a friend with a car and she felt she didn't need it. Something untoward happens her. Maybe even far from Rockgar. Three, she's in plain sight in a busy urban area. She's abducted with no witnesses as her family suspect. Four, she returns home unseen by anybody and meets someone that evening and something untoward happens going out or meeting them at home or, or at home closer to home wherever five secretly depressed she returns home again unseen by anybody and plans to take her own life elsewhere or simply disappear somewhere else for a new life for the next 30 years having given her family the short shift for the day she goes to where she is always welcome beyond our family or prayer group friends something untoward happens later that day now some of the above scenarios don't seem plausible to me no That's i was some... gonna say yeah sorry Nick. i was gonna say um for me number one and number five i would say would be the unlikely right that would be the way i would look at that yeah what about if um say she left her parents home seeing someone she knew in a car they gave her a lift to her apartment, arranged to meet her later that night, and then they picked her up from the apartment. That's entirely possible. Yeah, that's you know, entirely possible. Yeah. Because I'm sure the guards checked the landline, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's And we don't... That's another thing that's missing from this entire case. And again, because the fucking guards weren't paying attention, hadn't got the eye in the ball from the start. We've no telecoms. No. Like, no. like Jesus Christ... Annie, who disappeared four months before that, we've got tele. We had telecoms analysis on that case. Why couldn't it be done in this case? Where's the landline registration oh, no. data? That's very important, isn't it? Yeah, and that was with Annie's case. That was a damn public phone box, for God's sake. They were they able to get that, that data from. Sure, Marie Claire Martin. They tracked that. Yeah. Tracked her landline phone call to a yeah. payphone. It's leash. nuts. This this was a shoddy case from the start, with nobody with their eye on the ball. So like, what, like back then, even then, the records start to disappear after a while or something. Was it? Is that the way it worked? Come back on, then, yeah. well, you, you pick up the phone now. You're not going to get any records now. All that is gone. CCTV, if it ever existed, landline communication. Like forget really at that stage I wouldn't even go into uh, uh, mobile phones were in their absolute no, infancy no, no. in Ireland yeah, no, um, right. so you know that's that's gone that data is gone 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 now it doesn't exist anymore it's, it's useless now it's, it, tell, it's, it doesn't exist it's not going to tell us anything but that was all missed and not followed up on so some of the above scenario maybe don't seem plausible to me that somehow Eva harmed herself and her body simply hasn't been found after 30 years, or it was found, and with the more recent developments in DNA matching in the Garda database, no unidentified body has been recovered and matched to Eva's case. Or that she was abducted by a stranger in broad daylight in Ternure or Rakgar, and no one witnessed anything. Or that Eva sought out a new life somewhere else. That someone, that something more untoward happened that lunchtime in the family home and it has been somehow concealed by eight family members. Yeah. Of various ages. Yeah, of various ages. Yeah. That her home was burgled, Madison uh, House, on the Sunday or Monday, possibly, maybe, and something awful happened there. Now I did examine one other possibility and I know if I don't cover this somebody's going to mention it. Given her father's status as a successful businessman well connected, could Eva have been kidnapped for monetary gain? If so, what happened to the ransom request? Then if it was, it was a botched ransom. This would have had to have been a targeted and organised crime involving multiple people and pretty much if this did happen, the case Believe me, the case would then have exploded into news headlines. For me, the answer is within the silence, as so often it is, and the people Eva Brennan trusted beyond our family. Eva had only two fallbacks in life for support, family and our prayer group. 
with a nose out of joint on that Sunday, that's where Eva would have gone for solace and reassurance, or at the very least an avenue to share dinner with. She trusted the people in her prayer group, while there was a sharpness and yet childlike naivety to Eva. She was hyper aware of her own safety. She wasn't a risk taker. She was not some wild adventurous adult out of control. She chose to live happily in a very tight trusted community from family to friends. So let's be honest about this case with no disrespect to Eva or our loving family. Eva lived a very sheltered and protected life. She did not have the means wherewithal and again let's be blunt the courage a wider worldly outlook to just disappear and create a new life somewhere else. Kieran. Oh, without a doubt, I, I would agree with you on that. Like in 1993, she, she and her passport was found in the, the passport was found in the house. Yeah, yeah, and as you said, like her life depended on her family, it seems. So why would she leave that? And like all her comforts and everything are there. Her family was everything to her, even though probably her family would be the first sight. She didn't always, you know, reflect that or you know some of the things she said, the way she behaved. But you can believe that even knew then, where her bread was buttered. If her family are everything to her, I suppose they're going to see like every side of her character. Then, of course, you know, that we that her, we her wouldn't, and that that's fair enough. Yeah. We understand. When, like I said, we're not. When we talked about that picture that the media used, we're not all perfect. So please don't portray people as this, as this perfect. We're not all Vogue magazine people living a perfect life. We all have our imperfections, quirks, idiosyncrasies, and characteristics. Yeah, no, and the, like. The suicide thing is just um it's it's implausible in my opinion would you think yeah I mean, you would argue that uh, her body should have been found you know where does she go you know it's often waterway you know let's face it if if um even decided to take her own life she did it on should we say land or apartment street somewhere someone else's place I don't know whatever her body would have been found full stop no arguments there no and of I course think if she shot, sought out a waterway which maybe might be more common a bridge that, well okay there's possibilities no matter how much searching goes on we have seen it in cases no ultimately a body isn't found but from what I've researched on the case um, it, it seemed that she didn't really leave the kind of Rakar Terranur area much at all right no no, I, I think as as Colette, um, in in several interviews, uh, quipped, you know, um, you know, to some members of the family, including Eva, you know, going to the parents' house required a passport, you know, that they, they didn't, they were closely knit within their communities, you know, um. But I suppose, like on that on that point there about her always staying around the area, and then. Her life is like extremely based on routine. Go to her parents' house every day. The prayer church, group, church, the prayer group. yeah, so, close knit like, friend. I group, always yeah. thought. Now, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I always thought that her lifestyle would have left her quite vulnerable to being stalked. Like, yeah, you know, you know. yeah, that 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 would be my my thinking there. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Um, I, uh, Sarah McInerney does also say in her book uh, where no one can hear or scream uh, I think this is on page 159 even though there was a church right beside her apartment even normally went to mass in St. Joseph's in Ternier where she'd been going for years that that was the family church originally uh, she knew Monsignor Grehe there um, says Colette uh, she knew all the priests around the area she used to go to prayer groups there in the evenings as well that was what she enjoyed doing <coughs> uh, in 30 years we've heard nothing from Eva's prayer group sad isn't it this, you know but I oh, you know there's a reason for that we many of them campaign true wouldn't you, you yeah, think yeah, yeah. many of them we cannot go into here for legal reasons and some of the characters and behaviour of members of this prayer group you may not be aware of there's a reason why they haven't spoken publicly about knowing Eva or being associated with Eva Brennan because members of that group have come under scrutiny by Angarda Chiacana in links with other missing person cases through their activities and associations 
to religious and youth groups in the areas of Raffarnham, Ternure and further afield. Uh, Colette also goes on she wouldn't go for a walk unless she was going somewhere says Colette uh, she wasn't the type uh, just to head out for a stroll for the sake of it um, the only things uh, we're pretty sure know is that she didn't head towards Tenure because my brother Paul's was on Paul's house was on uh, the way to mum and dad uh, she's talking like if if Eva went out and passed between her own Madison uh, house apartment and her parents. Uh, Paul's wasn't far off from there. If she was pissed off about something with the, the family that day, she would have called into Paul. Um, it's also notable that the Brennans found uh, two of Eva's address books and systematically started calling everyone on the list when they felt they had to do it if the guards weren't going to. Um, yeah, we, we've touched on the, the boyfriends. And Mick, I was just going to say, um, when you were talking about the um, prayer group, the Legion of Mary, um, you, you know Gar O'Callaghan, don't you? He's quite respected, and I think he was on RTE, and he's on Classic FM now. He's done like some investigating. Into yeah, yeah, he's still active on the radio now, yeah. Yeah, so um, he's actually wrote a report on Eva's case, Claire Boylan's case, uh, Philip Cairns. I'm sure most people watching this would know about that case. Yeah, yep. if you just search in his name, I suppose Gary O'Callaghan and Eva Brennan or whatever, a lot of information will come up, and he seems to be the one that's really went after this group anyway and named them. Yeah, and and we followed up on some of the information that Gary provided, and uh, I, I can't go into it anymore. But we have found significant substance in some of the things that Gareth O'Callaghan has suggested. And uh, I don't know, I'm just going to speak for myself now, not you at all, but I'd be like very willing to talk to him, like, would you? <laughs> if Garrett sees this, um, he's, I'm happy to talk to him, uh, whether he wants to do it publicly or privately, absolutely. Um, and we can go into and exchange what we know that maybe we can't go into here. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, that's an open invitation to Gareth O'Callaghan, if he wants to talk to me, talk to you. Uh, about this case um, and not just specifically about this case uh, because I know um, he believes there are other connections uh, to the um, specifically the uh, Philip Cairns uh, case as well and that's a case that we've covered here on Radio Spoil and I I'm, I'm happy at any time to revisit those with, with, with Garrett um, both cases, um, Eva's case yeah. and Philip's case because yeah, he's back on the radio again. Anyway, isn't he these days? I believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and he he remains he remains an active voice on on social media as well. Uh, and and from time to time, he does still revisit uh, these cases and and speak about them. And a good DJ from what you hear on the radio. Yeah, well, from what I remember, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so prior to Eva's disappearance, she was very conscious of the cases of Philip Cairns, Annie McCarrick. Remember, Annie McCarrick, just four months earlier, the challenges her own Catholic Church and faith faced. Eva was always candid in our opinions, quiet among strangers, but not a shrinking violet among friends she trusted. Her prayer group was no different. She was with friends. Deep down, Eva Brennan was a good soul in a classic Irish sense. She understood her vulnerabilities and valued trust. She lived by her creed as best she could. I don't believe she's with us now, and she played no hand in that. Her case should have been escalated to murder years ago with all the resources that come with that. But here we are again with another such case. You know, there's an old adage before we finish up. You keep your friends close, but your enemies even closer. And I don't think that could be a true word in this case. Except... I do remain unconvinced that Eva's upbringing, despite her ways, choice of life and beliefs, all the love and care and support her family gave her, really quite equipped her to know the difference. And that's where the truth lies in this case of Eva Brennan. Kieran, do you want to go through your final thoughts on the case? 
Yeah, just there what you're saying, it seems that she had quite an idyllic view of the church and probably would have trusted. And and, and that's fine. That's yeah. fine. We're, we're, we're not judging that. That That's okay. That's fine. But, you know, like the prayer group and all that, she yeah. probably would have been quite trusting of anything yeah. Yeah. Uh, to do with the church. But I just... Um, just back that recently, uh, Alan Bailey was pushing that the case gets upgraded to a murder inquiry, and I suppose with Gary O'Callaghan, and then like that. Now you've reported on and stuff that I hope it's one of them cases that starts to become a bit more prominent, and there might yeah, be and and we, we know what happens cases. It's it's like it's like it's like a, a switch triggered when a case mm. goes from missing person to murder, bang. The amount of resources that are immediately freed up that can be redirected into that case. Yeah. More officers back on board. Um, somebody more senior is appointed. Uh, it often goes back to the um, Guard of Serious Crimes Unit back again, although we do believe this case has come under their remit, but I don't know how much attention it's been given. Okay, it's It's yeah. been looked at, but has it been looked at exclusively as this case i'm not as right, convinced yeah, it has I've had the cold case i think it, it's been I've looked at in in conjunction with oh, well we're looking at this case but does eva's case have some similarity yeah you know, i don't think anybody has ever said let's look at this case with a focus on this case and maybe there are branches off to other cases but let's look at this case and mm. those kind of resources only come when our case has been escalated yeah, to the be, level of the murder. Guards, the guards have a name for I think it's cold case something or other. It's, it, it's, like par, it's part of this. So the, the, uh, it's some, sometimes case. the officers exchange teams. It's the GS, the Guard of Serious Crimes Unit uh, review yeah, unit. It, yeah. um, and yeah. there are, there, they do have also a separate um, independent, not outsourced, but where often ex guardy come in and that's that's also a cold case review uh, system that literally also reviews what the GSCR does as well. So th it, there's a dual thing happening there uh, to okay. try and unearth information. So hopefully this case comes up on it then anyway. Well, I'd like to. And um, yeah, you know. Um, well, I, I wouldn't give up on this one yet, though. I think. Oh, no, 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 I'm not. And, and as, as well, no, I think there's too much substance in it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and you're, uh, do you know what, a, a good point is when you initially look at a case, it doesn't look, look like there's much substance in it. But if you look at yeah, when, when, when you do, we do, and you out. deep you deep dive into it, then suddenly you go, "Whoa, hang on a second, You know, why wasn't this looked at? Why wasn't that looked at? Why is there a shortfall here? What happened there? Why hasn't somebody paid more attention to this?" And that's that's the problem. Yeah, if you look at it, say. Um, Claire Boyle and we covered that one and you've covered Philip Kearns and Eva Brennan that's a very small little yeah. place like you know and, and also all. the uh, Annette Smith um, case wasn't that million miles away from this area as well I think more south yeah. the Raffarnham area as well um, it's yeah. all south Dublin anyway yeah, yeah. okay look uh, that's where we are uh, thank you for joining Kieran and I on Radio Spoil for this episode Thanks, uh, Mick. Good work with the timeline. Yeah, line. yeah. yeah. The, 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 uh, there was there was a there was a lot in this, a lot in this yeah. that we didn't quite expect uh, when we really started doing the deep dive. As always, uh, God bless to everyone. Thanks for all the support. Please take care of each other, and we'll see you Thanks, again Mick. soon in uh, another episode. Thank you. <laughs>